Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Covering crime and corruption in Mexico may be the most dangerous job in the world of journalism. On average, 10 journalists have been killed every year since 2006, and attacks on the media have increased since a new president took office nine months ago. Not one of the killers is behind bars, and very few of the attackers and abductors have been arrested, let alone convicted. Of course, the same impunity exists for drug cartel thugs and corrupt government officials who target non-journalists. However, two recent actions give some reason to believe the situation could improve. First, the military arrested the leader of Los Zetas, a criminal organization that has become one of the dominant players in Mexico's drug trade. Second, new legislation gives the federal attorney more power to investigate and prosecute crimes against journalists and human rights advocates. On our program today, we'll hear from a press freedom activist and two Mexican journalists, a newspaper reporter who risks her life to aggressively write about local government corruption and failures in the judicial system, and an executive from a newspaper that has been attacked by drug cartels three times so far this year with grenades and bombs. But first, World Watch, our brief summary of international news with Raymond Tungakar. Russia says it will present evidence to the United Nations implicating Syrian rebels in a chemical gas attack last month. This comes days after the UN released a chemical weapons report that concluded the nerve agent sarin was used in a gas attack in the Damascus suburbs on August 21st. Russia has condemned the report as one-sided and biased. Meanwhile, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad pledged to dismantle his regime's chemical weapons arsenal during an hour-long interview with Fox News yesterday, but he warned that it could take up to a year. Iran has freed 11 of the country's most prominent political prisoners. The prisoner release yesterday coincides with President Hassan Rouhani's visit to New York to attend the annual session of the United Nations General Assembly. Human rights lawyer Nasreen Satoude is one of the freed political prisoners. She was arrested in 2010 and jailed for six years on charges of acting against national security. European nations have promised to give Somalia nearly $3 billion to help rebuild the country after two decades of civil war. The money is part of a new deal signed this week by delegates from 50 countries across Africa, Europe, and the Persian Gulf. Monitors say Somalia was recently cleared of corruption charges, and the country has a more legitimate government, less corruption, and better security. Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff has postponed a planned visit to the U.S. next month over concerns that the National Security Agency spied on her, other top aides, and the state oil company Petrobras. In a statement, Rousseff called for a, quote, timely investigation of the incident. Cubans and Americans may soon be able to mail letters back and forth. U.S. and Cuban representatives met in Havana this week for renewed talks on establishing direct mail service between the two countries. Mail service was suspended in 1963, so letters are routed through other countries, such as Mexico and Canada. The talks mark the most amount of contact the two countries have had in decades. The four men convicted of raping and murdering a 23-year-old woman in New Delhi last December have been sentenced to death by hanging. Judge Yogesh Khanna denied pleas for a lighter sentence, saying the attack, quote, shocked the collective conscience of India. The incident sparked countrywide protests and led to stricter laws on sexual violence. The Ukrainian government has approved a draft agreement with the European Union. The association agreement is scheduled to be signed in November. Ukraine's prime minister says the country will meet the criteria for democratic progress laid down by the EU as preconditions for signing the document. EU ministers also want the government to release imprisoned opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko. Russia opposes the agreement and wants Ukraine to join its customs union instead. And that'll do it for World Watch. Thank you, Raymond. Javier Garza Ramos is deputy director at the daily newspaper in Torreon a city in northern Mexico that's been caught in the crossfire of two competing drug cartels. Sandra Rodriguez Nieto worked for a decade at El Diario, a newspaper in Juarez where several close colleagues have been killed. Our third guest is Scott Griffin. He's the press freedom advisor for Latin America at the International Press Institute. Welcome to Global Journalist. Thank you. Thank you. Javier, uh, could you tell us about your newspaper and what it's been like to work there during the past few years? Uh, well, my newspaper is called El Siglo. It's in the city of Torreón, which is a metropolitan area of uh, about a million people in northern Mexico. And for the past seven years, this 
this area, this region has been uh, under dispute by different uh, drug cartels, you know, trying to control the, the territory, not only the drug flow uh, to the, the U.S. border, but also the inner market of the local crime criminal market, extortion, kidnapping, mm -hmm. uh, contraband, uh, uh, drug dealing, things like that, prostitution, things like that. Uh, so, as a newspaper, uh, one of the first things that we started noticing in in this uh, war against the cartel is that one of the first things that a cartel tried to do in a, in a place or in a city where where they were attempting to gain control is try to con also control what the media say mm -hmm. about them, what the media publishes, uh, what it broadcasts about the violence that they're unleashing on, on the city. So the threats begin, the attacks begin, you know, reprisals for publishing stories that they don't like uh, or in a way that they don't, that they don't want. So it's, uh, yeah. there's always this mood of uncertainty because you never knew, uh, you know, when, when the strike was going to come, you know, uh, where the blow was going to come from. And especially if you're uh, in, in a city where, there is a dispute between two cartels, mm -hmm. and you get caught in the crossfire because you run the risk of if you publish a story that a uh, uh, you know that a cartel might not like, or maybe the the rival cartel might not like. Uh, it's a uh, it's a no way out situation. And could you give us uh, some more details about the two attacks this year that you witnessed? Well, uh, the two attacks. They, 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 they're not the only ones that we that we suffered. Uh, right. I mean, I, I would have to go back to to where this started. At least uh, in in the attacks against us was the first one in 2009 mm -hmm. in August, uh, and the second one in November of 2011. Uh, these were uh, shootings against the the buildings uh, in the. Uh, but they were during uh, at night. The, one of them was at two in the morning, and the other one was at three thirty in the morning. So it wasn't really an attack against the staff. It was just a, an attack against the building in a message of, of intimidation. Uh, and we started taking some safety measures that we started developing because there there were no there was no investigation from mm -hmm. from the authority. Uh, no suspects were arrested. There was never a trial. I mean, there wasn't even really an, an investigation of the whole the, the whole matter. Um, and uh, we tried to, you know, steer clear of, of attacks by trying to take our own our own protections. We we kept publishing everything that was going on, all the, the crime stories, uh, but tried to do so in a way that we would not fear uh, a reprisal from the from the cartels. You know, try not to. Give them too much prominence in our in our page. Um, however, at the beginning of this year, there was a, a wave of violence uh, that seemed to be getting out of out of control, and one of the the, the cartels that seemed to be, uh, you know, unleashing this this level of violence. Uh, and what they did, uh, one of the things that they did, which was extraordinary, was that they kidnapped. Five uh, workers of El Siglo, uh, but none of them that had to do with uh, with the newsroom. None of them were editorial employees. None of them was a reporter or editor or photographer. They were from other areas mm -hmm. in the paper. They were kidnapped uh, one evening uh, and released the next day with with no message really, but the, the message was implicit. You know, there was a message of intimidation about you know stop publishing the stuff that that they were doing in the city. They were, you yeah. know, shooting at buildings, public officials. They were burning businesses, things like that. That's incredible. And and Sandra, have the experiences at uh, El Diario been similar? Well, uh, not quite similar. We uh, experienced um, more straight uh, violence. We in two thousand eight, uh, uh, eight months after the. This, the beginning of the confrontation or, or the dispute for the city, mm -hmm. uh, somebody shot a colleague of us. 
he was a crime reporter. He was the most experienced journalist in the city. And he has received many threats. So it was a very clear message yes. of silence. Uh, trying to 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 silence us. Uh, and then in 2010, somebody else shot a young photographer. So the situation is not like trying to intimidate us, but rather to really, really uh, silence some people. So More targeted, I, yeah. Yes. More and hmm, sorry. More targeted against individuals. Exactly, and I think if the the cartels fighting for quarters are different than the cartels fighting for for Torreon, I think that the Zetas behave uh, different. They are more aggressive. More, they try to control. Um, broader than, than the Juarez cartels, for instance, or the Sinaloa cartels, cartel in, in Juarez. Okay. And, and Scott, you closely follow developments in Mexico um, and recently went there on a fact-finding mission. Uh, are these terrible experiences at these two newspapers typical? Uh, yeah, unfortunately they are. I mean, the, the case that Sandra was referring to in 2008, uh, I guess she's talking about El Choco. Um, which um, sort of brings me into one of the reasons we went to Mexico in February was to assess progress uh, in two important measures that the federal government has taken to combat impunity and, and protect journalist safety in Mexico. And one of those uh, is the Office of the Federal Special Prosecutor for Crimes Against Freedom of Expression, which was created in 2006 under a different name. Mm -hmm. uh, but before 2013... Uh, after the passage of a constitutional amendment and after the passage of following legislation that was necessary to put that amendment into effect, had done essentially nothing. It had mm -hmm. conducted some parallel investigations, uh, but had no jurisdiction and uh, had not put anyone behind bars who was responsible for a crime against a journalist. Um, and actually, just this August, last mm -hmm. month, finally, uh, this case in Juarez of El Choco, his name is Armando Rodriguez, uh, is going to be the first case that this office has assumed jurisdiction over. So this is something, for example, that we've been following very closely. And when we went to Mexico in February, we met with the special prosecutor uh, and basically encouraging the, the federal government to be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And now that the government has this power, Mexico has a federal system. So previously states have been responsible for prosecuting these sorts of crimes, homicides that are normally reserved for local jurisdiction, the federal government now has the power to as assume jurisdiction, basically, over, over crimes against journalists. And we're hoping now that the federal government will be more aggressive in doing that. Right now, they've been sort of waiting to be given those cases. But this, uh, this case, this 2008 killing in, in Juarez, is the first case that the prosecutor has, has taken. So we're hoping that there will finally be some progress because this occurred in 2008 and there's been nothing, nothing has occurred since. Sandra, what what uh, what is your opinion about this new legislation and its impact? Do you do you think that uh, uh, it will it will make it will change things? Well, I have been pretty skeptical of the jurisdiction of the federal government because so far they may have done something since the beginning, despite the jurisdiction problem. They may uh, they may uh, attract or take the case as a federal case since the beginning if they would like to, if they went, if, because that is the possibility given the type of, uh, of gun that was used in the crime. So the crime could have been taken by the federal government right after this, the next day, and they never did it. Mm -hmm. So now I think that it's just a political position. I'm pretty skeptical. And I'm sure that since I have uh, seen the, the file, I mean, the, the information in the, in the case, it is pretty difficult to follow a case uh, five years yeah. after it was committed. And, and uh, I think it's more like a, 
political um, it's a position just to say that they are doing something. I hope and I would love to see some advance in some people behind bars. But unfortunately, I think that it's not going to be the case given the level of impunity or the people that might be involved in the crime. And Javier, do you share Sandra's pessimism? Well, uh, not pessimism. I'm, I'm skeptical. I'm still okay. skeptical. All right. Uh, I think uh, I don't think the the problem, uh, whether you federalize or not, uh, is something that you're going to be dealing with only after the the authorities show the willingness to actually prosecute these, investigate mm-hmm. and prosecute these crimes. Uh, in in the experiences that we've had in the first two experiences, uh, when uh, attacks against uh, journalists or, or news organizations were a federal crime, but the federal uh, attorney general did not have uh, the legal uh, authority to prosecute and try under the federal system. Uh, there was still an investigation done by the special um, prosecutor for crimes against freedom of expression. Mm-hmm. There was an investigation. There was a, a you know a file opened up that never had any follow-up. So if there is really not a willingness to to prosecute, it doesn't really matter whether it's a federal or a state matter or a local matter. So I think that first there has to be uh, the willingness to to actually investigate and prosecute these crimes. But I think before that has to come the really key part uh, element of uh, avoiding the uh, crimes against journalists, which is to uh, deter the criminals from actually carrying them out. I mean, I think the government has to show that uh, attacks against the media uh, will be met by by a strong reaction mm-hmm. uh, so that the criminals would not think of trying it. Uh, the, the whole issue of impunity, I think, really boils, boils down to that. I'm convinced that the second attack against us in November of 2011 was fueled by the fact that the first one went unpunished. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, or not even, uh, more than unpunished, went unanswered. Right. In, in any way, in any form. Um, and the, the third, the, the kidnapping of, of, uh, of my colleagues in, in February uh, was also fueled by the fact that the two previous attacks had, uh, also went unanswered by, by the authorities. Not, not only not prosecuted, but uh, I mean, the people that carried them out were still you know, free in the city to do whatever they wanted. You know? and, they, and they were responsible for other crimes mm-hmm. for which they weren't even prosecuted. I've always been skeptical about special laws protecting journalists because I really don't think that I deserve any more protection than my neighbor, who's not a journalist. Mm-hmm. Right? I, I'm not. I, I don't understand the logic of why the the person who's going to kill me is going to get 50 years in jail, and the person who kills a friend of mine, who's just who's a businessman, uh, is just going to get 30 years in prison. Right? Okay. Well, Scott, it doesn't maybe really matter if they don't. If both of them don't go to jail. Right. Well, Scott, let me ask you if you can add a bit of perspective on that. I mean, to me, the attacks on journalism, journalists is an attack on free expression, and free expression is uh, the watchdog on the the, uh, government and uh, um, criminal elements. So would you agree with that? Well, I mean, I I completely agree with Javier that uh, journalists don't deserve any more special protection than anyone. But... um, we do think that crimes against journalists fall into a special category because of the role of a journalist in society. So a journalist's role is to inform, inform the people. It's critical to a democracy. Um, and so that's why, that's why we have to treat them in a, in a different way or, or in, a, in a separate way. But it doesn't mean that they're, they're special people, right. I think. Right. But, but um, I would completely agree also with, with the skepticism that, you know, we're talking about a federal government that has completely failed to to respond to the crisis. I mean, again, this office was this special prosecutor was created in 2006, and it cannot be that for seven years nothing has been done. It cannot be that you pass a constitutional amendment, but then need a whole another year to put it into effect. So when you have these kind of um, institutions that you set up that don't do anything, mm-hmm. there's nothing behind them. There's no action behind them. Then, of course. Uh, of course, there's going to be skepticism, right. and we're still skeptical because nothing. Still, I mean, 
some of these cases now have been taken by the prosecutor, but there's been no, there still are no results. So. And, and let's put a little bit of perspective on this throughout Mexico. Most people assume the attacks on journalists are related, all related to the drug cartel activities, but but that's not true, is it, Scott? There's well, I think it's it's complicated. When we visited the special prosecutor's office, um, they estimated about seventy per seventy percent of the cases that reach their office, uh, the lead aggressor is a public official. So there's clearly still a lot of corruption going on at the local level. Public officials are playing a major role in aggression against journalists. And you, on top of that, you have still have state governments uh, that behave in author an authoritarian manner. For example, Veracruz. Um, you know, when we visited the Veracruz government in, in February, uh, it was sort of this astonishing experience when they told us that yeah, freedom of expression is 100% guaranteed in Veracruz, uh, mm. and that uh, they've never heard of anything uh, about exiled journalists or, or journalists that have been killed because of their profession, whereas the journalists that we met from Veracruz that have been exiled from the state, self-exiled, say that the government itself is the problem, that they, that they exercise authoritarian mm. control over information. So this is also going on. And this is in the same party as the president, the party that, that rules Veracruz. So, of course, we have this major drug violence, but we also have governments that are that are intolerant and that uh, have turned a blind eye, basically, right. to, to the problem. Let, let, let me just uh, add a little bit to what Scott was saying. Okay. Um, it is true that most of the attacks or, or threats uh, or aggressions against journalists come from public officials. Uh, the, the, uh, the special prosecutor has that figure of 70 percent. Uh, uh, a, a report by Article 19 has it a little bit lower, but in the same ballpark. Uh, however, the attacks carried out by organized crime are the most violent. Mm -hmm. So they're the That's ones true. that get the most attention. Right. Public officials usually intimidate uh, or, or verbally uh, threaten or physically threaten but uh, so far as, uh, as we know, uh, the, the killing of a journalist or the mm -hmm. attack on a news organization carried out by public officials um, is, is still, uh, it's rare. Right. They it, have a different absolutely. form of intimidation, whereas okay. the absolutely. cartel, uh, when they attack a news organization or a journalist, they do it in the most violent way uh, possible so as to send a message. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's also, I think, one of the, the, the key parts is how, how can the government deter the, the criminal organization right. from, targeting, uh, from targeting journals? Scott, do you have a, uh, an idea about that, about how, how there could be a better deterrence? Well, I, I think the, the biggest deterrent is, is, uh, is fighting impunity. I mean, right. as we've already discussed that. That every time a journalist is, is killed or attacked or threatened, nothing happens. So okay. if you know that nothing will happen when you commit a crime, there's going to be no punishment for you. There's going to be no follow-up for you, anything. Of course, this takes away any kind of deterrent against, against committing the crime in the first place. So it's, I mean, in a way, it's, it's not really surprising. Okay. Now, um, I want to, yeah. Scott, I want, uh, yeah. I want to change the topic a bit. I want to talk about how this violence is changing uh, Mexican media in general. But before we continue our discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to our program on our website. This week, there's a timeline of drug cartel problems and statistics about widespread abductions, aka disappearances, in Mexico. So please send us questions or comments via Global Journalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. You could also follow us on Twitter at Global Jorn. So, Sandra, I'll bring you back into the discussion. Uh, how has this violence uh, affected Mexican media overall? Well, so I think that has been many different reactions across the country. Some out media outlets have uh, decided to completely uh, not say anything about the uh, violence, for instance, that is the case in Tamaulipas. Mm -hmm. Some other newspapers uh, have decided to keep on going. It depends on the circumstances, maybe the strength 
of the media by, by itself, like is the case in Juarez. In Juarez, as you may know, um, there has been a lot of attention since, uh, international attention in the last 20 years because of the killing of women, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult to, to completely uh, shut the information down. Uh, for us, after the killing of our colleague, Armando, who was a very close friend, our reaction was not to be scared, but rather to be really angry, and we decided together to keep on doing the work. And uh, in my case, I decided to be even more aggressive, more mm -hmm. in-depth, and try to do the things the best that I could in order to 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 do the work that the city needs in that terrible circumstances. So it's, but I think that uh, the general reaction has been uh, fear, and a lot of reporters uh, have decided to not to work in the topic. Mm -hmm. while all the reporters have decided to go farther. So there is a lot of books in the topic, as you may know. Uh, Annabel Hernandez, she just uh, wrote uh, an extraordinary mm -hmm. book about the collusion or the uh, relations among the federal government and the mm -hmm. uh, Sinaloa cartel, and the book has been just translated into English. And what's the title right. of that? What's the title of that book? Uh, in Spanish, is at the Los Señores del Narco, which could be translated like the Drug Lord or something. Okay, and, and, and uh, sorry, cut you off, Scott. Sandra, we just have a minute left. Uh, Scott, could you uh, also discuss the uh, uh, the overall impact in the final in our final minute? Well, I mean, obviously, Sandra and Javier can discuss the impact on or more exactly what's going on in Mexico. But from our experience, IPI, we work globally in countries all around the world that whenever you have this kind of violence, whenever the media is being targeted, there's always one obvious uh, consequence, which is that the people are not being informed. The people don't know what's going on in their country, that uh, corrupt acts are remain hidden. Um, and this is... This is um, simply stands in the way of, of democracy. So, I mean, this is something that happens all around the world, not just in Mexico, but uh, we know it's happening there. Okay. Well, thank you uh, uh, for, for being on the show today. And, and, and Sandra and Javier, uh, I'm amazed at your bravery and, and hope uh, you, you and your staffs continue to, st to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Global Journalist is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Joining us today was Scott Griffin from the International Press Institute, along with Mexican journalist Sandra Rodriguez Nieto, who's now studying at Harvard University, and Javier Garza Ramos. Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Victoria Mitskute was this week's lead producer. Please join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. <laughs>